Okay, so welcome back for session five of CE 120 Today we are going to continue kind of pushing this whole notion of how we can go through and generate interesting forms mathematically and place elements along those forms. Moving beyond just sort of like uh, simple components like beams and trusses and kind of skeletal things, to actually starting to work with surfaces and thinking about how surfaces start getting all divided up and panelized and uh, just ultimately uh, used within Revit. This, uh, what we're going to do today is incredibly useful for especially uh, folks who are interested in facade design because a lot, a lot of times people will define a form using, uh, whether it's in Rhino and Grasshopper or within Revit, they'll define a form, some sort of a surface which has an unusual shape and you need to panelize it. You need to go through and actually put regular uh, curtain panel system on top of that. So we need to subdivide the surface and do a lot of things to it. So today we're going like, to spend some time looking at how we can grab some surfaces, divide them into different panels, okay, apply different adaptive panels to them, but also start to colorize them. Uh, do a different thing where we can vary the way that surface appears based on the data that we're reading, either from files, like from a photograph, or from things like uh, reading information about like how we are arranged to the sun. So, to recap where we were and where we're going, uh, we're kind of in this territory of we were last time creating parametric and adaptive families. So we looked at how we could do that with sort of a standard parametric family, just kind of a typical red family that isn't adaptive but adds some parametric features. And we're all starting to look at how we create adaptive components where we had a series of different points and those points were going to be used as placement. Um, we sort of finished up last time just looking at if we have some Revit curves, how we can start to place points along those curves and use those as placement points for panels, or for uh, adaptive components. And that's kind of the territory we were in. Some of the common things we were doing last time. Oh, I just we'll keep on maintaining this list. This is whole notion of, oh, either grabbing geometry from a Revit element where we sort of select something in Revit and either pull out a curve or pull out the underlying geometry. We are, we're doing a little placing of points on a curve, like curve point and distance. And we're going to start doing a lot of list things, things that just involve working with a list where the list may need to be reoriented, transposed, it may need to be uh, like counted, it may need to be deflated, where we flatten it out a little bit so that there aren't so many levels of hierarchy. We're also going to learn a little about how we sort of inflate a list, because a lot of times what you're doing just really depends on getting the list in the right order or the right sense of hierarchy so that you can work with it. So for getting going today, let's go ahead and we're going to keep on working with curves just a little bit more. Last time where we left off, we were looking at some curves that we selected from Revit and placing some points along that. And oh, I should actually still get to use this like that. Well, this is a little practice thing out there if you want to kind of play with it. The whole notion of being able to grab some curves and then place some points along it. And we sort of looked at it just right at the tail end last time. Let me just sort of open it up again. If you go to session five, you'll find all sorts of good stuff in the session five Dynamo examples. So go on out there and download session five's Dynamo examples. You will find in there, I'll just open that little practice thing first, what I call these bridge rail lines. Where in the first example we were looking at, if you had the geometry defined in Revit, so we had defined some uh, just model lines there, <coughs> how we can place some objects on them. And what I'll do is I'll just take all these out, except for the model lines. Actually, I, I did a little too much taking out right there. Let me uh, grab these guys. I'm going to do a little filtering, just so I can keep the lines, but I'm going to take out the generic models. So you can sort of see those are the four underlying lines. And what the Dynamo script was doing was just grabbing those four different lines, placing points along those lines, and we were using them pairwise just to sort of put different elements together. So 
pretty straightforward stuff, but again, how it looked if we went over to Dynamo was, and this is in the folder called Practice right now, so you can go ahead and play around with this on your own. Open up my Dynamo, we'll say, let's go out to the examples and go to Practice. There's actually right there the Dynamo script that I was using, or the Dynamo graph. Let's just take a look at a high level at what it's doing again. It all starts with, in this case, all I'm really doing is grabbing some curves. So I'm using a lot of select model elements. Okay. From that, ultimately, I'm going to put curve point at parameter, where the parameters are, again, between 0 and 1. You want to use this relative distance along a curve. Okay, so I set up a little code block based on the number of points I want to have between them. Go ahead and compute those. This whole part of taking the model curves, creating a list out of them, and using that, as opposed to doing it independently, is just sort of an efficiency thing. You know, you could do that as every individual curve, but if you're going to do the same thing to a bunch of curves, sometimes it's easier to make a list and operate on the whole list. The cool thing about the list, though, is that you can still pull out the individual points. If that was list item one, and this is list item two, and that's three and four, or actually, let me be more proper, that's list item zero, that's one, two, and three, because it's a zero-based indexing system. Okay, all we're doing is going to take those curve points and based upon pulling out some different curve points, okay, we can go through and grab different points that we want to use. So for example, in the curve point of parameters, since I fed it four different lists, or four different curves, you'll see what I actually have is a list of four different sets of points. Okay, so now if I want to grab the elements from each of the specific curves, what I need to do is just basically just get the item at that index, getting item zero or getting item one or a pair of them. Yeah. Oh, this is in practice. Okay, so under session five, Okay, so you open the session five example. We'll see if we can find those. Oh. Okay, and it's hiding around in there. So we grab these different uh, sets of points. In the case of if I'm grabbing zero and one, I'm going to get the first and second ones in the list there. What I'm doing is just transposing them so I can get the points, two points that are sort of in the same location. And then always going through and adding just some sort of adaptive component. I'm using these little two-point tapered curves okay, to go through and adapt them. But let's go and do something a little bit different than what I had done before, just so we can sort of get a sense of it. For example, if I wanted to go through and put little ribs that were going between the lower rail on the left side and the lower rail on the right side, let's kind of think about that. So, if I remember properly, and I always get to sort of how I selected, I think I selected the curves as lower, upper, upper, lower. But again, I could be wrong on that. I'll be the first to admit that I could be wrong on that. So I think if I wanted to get the lowers, what I would be trying to do is get basically curve zero and curve three. Okay. So if I wanted to do something like that, See how we do it. It's all going to start with this list get item at index. Okay, that's an all-purpose great thing for grabbing things from lists. Let me go ahead and grab all of those different lists. And if what I'm interested in is grabbing, it's really the zero with and the third, what I'm going to do for the index is I could just feed it zero, I could just feed it three, <coughs> but if I put in a list in the code block, which would look like this, it would be open, uh, let's 
not parentheses, what is that? Brackets. 0, comma 3. Okay. That's essentially the shortcut way of creating a list. I could have said list create and gave it the integer 0 and the integer 3. Pull those out. That's now going to give me these two different lists of points, the zero with and the third. Okay, and if I want to make them pairwise, what's happening right now is here's the list of points running from either back to front or front to back around here. Same thing over here. If I want to have them go pairwise across, what I just have to do is do that list transpose. So that'll take two lists of nine elements each. Transpose. Okay, that should hopefully now give me nine lists of two elements each. Super. And now with those, I could go through and use those as adaptive component placement points. So if I want to use my little 2.2, .2, I can basically key this list of pairs of points to that 2.2. .2 and you will go through and put the tubes across. So same sort of thing here. I always have to do family types, although I have I've grabbed this family some other places too. It's just basically the part that lets us choose which family it is we're going to place. And if you've already chosen this node somewhere else, you can like, uh, just pull down from there. But what was it? It was my tube 2.2. And then finally, it's just adaptive components. That works. So I'll grab my little pairs of two points. I'll grab my family. Okay, and with any luck, let's see if we're doing them, how we're doing in the background there. Well, that's interesting. Oh, I still have some other things going on in there. Although, this is telling me something a little bit about my ordering. I can tell I'm a little wrong there in terms of where the zeroth and the third one is. So. What I can do is figure out really which one is which. But I think I just created there where these ones that are going across here. So I suspect my zero with one is my third one is probably not right. To me, it looks like one and three are your rails. Yes. In the rest of the code. So okay. Zero and two should be your case. Okay. So let us adapt. The logic should be right. It's just a matter of keeping track of where we are. So we think zero and two are there. So I must have gone to bottom top, bottom top. Change it to zero two. There we go. And I have a little base for my bridge. It's not looking too off the bed. If you want to put rails across the top there, if I, these are zero and two, you can also go ahead and try grabbing what is it, one and three, and that ought to be able to put the rails across the top. But the idea with all this is that really, once you've established what these points are, the nice thing is, if you come back over and you can grab the curve that's underneath any of these things, and there's a curve under here somewhere. I'm going to make this a little transparent or a wireframe so we can sort of see it. to select that curve, it keeps on flashing on me. There we go. Now I can go ahead and pull out that placement point. And Dynamo will adapt the design. So this whole idea of just basically making these skeletal structures works A-OK. -okay. Let's go ahead and kind of think about surfaces. Although before we get there, let me do you just we're going to flip it a little bit here and that. These curves are ones that we defined in Revit, and we grabbed the curves in Revit, and we're working that way. If you wanted to do this strictly mathematically, we could just kind of plot out x, y, z points and then create curves that way too. So let's just kind of look at that. That's just really the first example for today. And if you go on over to, I think it's 5.1. Go back over. Hey, yeah. I have yeah. a question about this example. Yes. Do you know where the points where zero and two are on the model? Oh, in terms of the curves or the. Yeah, I mean, is there, how do you determine that the index needs to be from zero to two or zero to three? Oh, it really had to do with just the order in which we selected them. 
So actually, here, uh, go back over there. Da, 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 da. Let's open up that Dynamo again. And it really is just the order. Let's go back up to the front of it. Go back to practice. What's on curve? All that happened actually right up here. So when we were selecting the curves, but for example, when I say change that one and I go out and grab that curve, okay, that became element zero. And the reason it's zero is only because when we put it together in the list, which is actually it's doing a little recomputing back there in there. When I put it in the list, it's just associated with index zero. So we just manually selected them and then put them in that order. So yeah, it just comes from that. We can rearrange them here or we can just kind of rootkick them again. Okay. okay. Is, yeah, there's no magic to it that way. I guess the trick is to remember which one you did. Okay, let me try opening up uh, 5.1. What we're going to do in 5.1 is as follows. We're just going to create some recurves, some reference points. So it's not all that dissimilar from what we've been doing. It's just kind of a slight inversion of it. In terms of the define something, what we're going to do is just say, hey, let's go ahead and create some reference points. Now, flip this down so you can sort of see. Okay, we're going to create some x, y, z values. So really, we're just going to put a bunch of like uh, x, y, z values in the sliders. We're going to create some points by saying the point by coordinates. So I've got some x, y, z. We'll just make some points out of those. Okay. Then we're going to create some reference points. Reference points are points that show up in Revit families. Okay, where we're going to grab this dynamo piece of geometry, or we actually make a Revit point out of it, a Revit reference point. Okay. Once we have a bunch of reference points, you can start a picture of making some x, y, z's and putting some points in space. We're going to just create a list of the different reference points. Okay, that's going to be a list create sort of operation. Okay. And then finally, we're going to create a curve where the curve is just going to say curve by reference points, and we'll pop a curve out of it. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward, but let's just kind of take a look at it. What I'm going to do is go over to 5.1. sort of see an example of one that's already <laughs> created there. If you want to, you can get rid of those just so it doesn't kind of clutter up your thinking. What I'm going to do is though add in Dynamo and let's just open up this, the graph. Okay, curve by points. I'll open 1A. mess in there. But there's one B, I cleaned it up better. Okay, here's the deal. I just basically have a series of different sliders that are going to be coordinating to X, Y, Z, and then I'm going to make a point out of them. So X, Y, Z is just going to take whatever values are there and go ahead and make a point. Now, the point that we're going to create here is going to be a point within uh, Dynamo. So as we run this, you'll see points are going to show up in this script. Okay. If we want those actually to show up as reference points in Revit, though, we connect those points to reference point by point, and then it makes the big old points over there. So let us try this and just sort of see what's happening. What I'm doing here is I actually have like three different sets of x, y, z coordinates. So there's three different sets of numbers. And I could identify the number sliders, but we just type in numbers too, if that's a little bit easier. Say, Make some X, Y, Z's, make some reference points. So when you go through and you run this, which again, 
that is something that looks like this. Actually, this is fully connected. So let me kind of disconnect the back end so that it's not confusing about what's happening so far. that something, oh, it's down here a little bit. Disconnect that. Okay. So you'll see here I have these three different reference points that are kind of hanging around in space. They're not doing too much, just sort of hang in there. If I go through and move the sliders, though, you ought to be able to change some things. So if I, oh, I'm going to pull that in there. I'm going to slide one of the x values. I'm going to make it auto so that we can sort of see it. So there's the x slider. As I'm moving that around, you can sort of see that lower point near the origin moving around. I can move the y if I want to move it up a little, or out a little. Z is moving it up a little. I don't really have like three points that are moving around. And this whole thing with a slider, really, you don't have to do it that way. You could just do this as a code block if you wanted to. For example, if you wanted to have a point at the origin, which some of you may want, what you can do is actually just type in, I'm going to still say point by coordinates. Yeah, I'll stick with that. But if I want to feed in there 0, 0, 0, or three different numbers, what I can do is just do a code block. That actually works very well, too. 0, 0, 0. And that would work. Actually, I didn't have to put all three zeros in there. I could have just dragged from a single 0. OK, so that's the Revit geometry. I'll say, uh, what is it, reference point? Pulling the point down to the reference point. Hang on, I'm doing the wrong one. Say reference point by point. If you're having trouble, and reference point just is one of those ones where there's a lot of uh, possibilities, just keep on typing. And it'll keep on on the list on the side, narrowing it down. There it is. Oops, where do we go? There it is. So I just created a point at the origin right now. The idea is, once I have all my fabulous points in here, I'd like to kind of connect them into a curve of some type. And of the many different functions that you have available, if you want to make a curve by reference points, <laughs> what you're going to do is basically feed it a list of points. The function I'm actually going to use is called curve by points reference points. It wants essentially a list of points. Okay, so what we need to do is just grab all our points and put them together in a list. So I have those three points that are already there. If I want to add my little origin point in here, I'll just add it into the list. Although, be careful about the order, because it'll try to do it from the first, second, or zero if first, second, third. So if that origin is actually going to be the first point, what I need to do is, oh, just kind of slide it in as zero. Then I'll pull the other ones in there. Actually, let me comment on some of this other stuff that's hanging around in here, because this is like old stuff that you know, I've since learned better ways to do it. I used to have this notion of putting empty lists and adding items to the front of the list, but it turns out that's actually a pretty inefficient way of doing it. So I'm going to just remove that so it just doesn't clutter things up. I really, the best way of creating your list is to say list create like that. Okay. So now I have four different points in there. If I have those four different points, I can say, let's go ahead and make a curve out of them. So go ahead and pull that point across. You'll see that that line now shows up in my dynamo geometry, but it also shows up in my Revit geometry. Oh, 
Okay, so not all that different. We had the points defined or the curves and their bound or uh, defining points defined in Reddit before. Now we're defining that map. But once we have these curves, if we want to go through and divide these curves up so we can place components on them, whether it's spheres or circles or boxes or adaptive components, whatever, it all still looks the same on the tail end. So what you do is you take those curves. We have to go through and basically pull the geometric curve out of it. But then what I'm going to do is just grab that curve and say, let's go ahead and put points in parameter. So if I want to put 12 points on, I'm going to put 12 points on. If I want to put 50 points on, I want to make a subtle distinction, but an important one. That, that there's a difference between these placement or well, whatever the definition points and then the placement points we're putting on the curve after we define it. Yeah, shut down. Um, let's see. Let's see what you got. Okay, so you got a reference point over there. It says sun over there. No property called point. Oh, it's a slightly different function. I pulled that one first. It's actually a reference point by point. Oh, okay. It does something about say. Yeah. That actually for a reference point, it return it's that's more grabbing the point from the reference point, returning the value where by point is your defining one. And it was weird that yeah, it's it's down in the list pretty far. So sometimes what I have to do is type reference point dot by, and it just kind of makes the list a little bit smaller and smaller, then dot, okay, and then, yes, you can see my point in there. Yeah. There you go. Super. So that's a definition as opposed to pulling it. Okay, now you can pull that down. Fantastic. We got points? Um, I think that this is point two or point by the, uh, let's go to point. Let's go to your function browser again. We'll say point by coordinates. There's actually a couple of different versions of it. One has x y, one has x y z. So grab that one instead. <coughs> so if it didn't have it, it assumes the z is zero. But if you want to have the ability, let's go ahead and super. Great. So we got this curve hanging around here. All sorts of points on it. It's looking good. Okay. Okay, what's happening is in curve point at parameter, there's a code block that goes from zero to one, so as you change this integer slider, it's changing the number of points along the curve. Right, okay. but how do I get to more than 12? Oh, okay, let's talk about that. If you have a slider and your slider is limited to a small number and you want to make it higher than the value of the slider, what you do is as follows. Okay, so the slider's kind of hanging around over here. If you Pop down on the slider, you can actually see the minimum and maximum values. And then you can sort of span that so it does about what you want. Yeah, but let's just kind of hang there for just a second, because in general, this whole notion of taking curves and putting points on curves, it's going to be a big one. We're going to keep on doing this a lot. Okay, so sort of making sense? More or less? Almost. Jackie, feeling good? Yeah. Okay. Not to worry. Once we have these, we could go ahead and put some family instances. For example, if you want to put spheres on them, I can take the curve points and use them as placement points, and then the family instance will grab them. Again, the sphere isn't an adaptive component, it's just sort of a regular Revit component. So all it's going to be looking for is a single placement point. Whereas if we start going for adaptive components, then we have to worry about the number of placement points that it might require. It kind of looks like a snake or a caterpillar or a worm or something. It got creepy all of a sudden. Okay. So if you want to make your worm wiggle, you can go ahead and like a... <coughs> Try dragging uh, like one of the uh, points. Okay. 
So that's just, again, two different ways, grab a curve and put points on the curve, or to find some uh, geometry mathematically and then put points on the curve. Two different ways of getting to the same basic spot. Okay, but what I want to show you is something that I think is kind of useful to do with that, and that is to go through and do a little mathematical definition that I think sort of gives you a shape that is actually very hard to define in other ways. And the shape that I keep referring to is a spiral shape, a helix shape, which is actually kind of a, com it's a complex shape. It really is. And just so uh, if you aren't familiar with the building, I go out here. Kind of just show here. Guggenheim. I spelled correctly. That's a pretty good uh, image of it right there. But in general, there's a lot of images that sort of help you understand the geometry. It's really sort of a very complex shape, really for its time when this was originally designed. This was built back in the 50s, actually designed earlier. Um, this was quite unusual to start thinking about doing a helical shape, something like this. Um, if we can think about even trying to do it with our kind of uh, building modeling tools today, it's somewhat complicated and difficult to model a shape like this in that you know, the, the wall is kind of this continuously rising curve that's both uh, kind of rising up but also sort of spreading out. Okay, it could be uh, kind of coming in too, but it's really quite an interesting and complex piece of geometry, stuff like that, and would have taken quite a while uh, to go through and dictate long ago. You know, nowadays, we actually have, you know, because we have all these computation tools, much easier ways of doing something like this. Let's see if I can pull that up. There's just some section views in terms of what's going on. You even see here that what's going on? You sort of see that the building kind of tapers out as we go from bottom to top. It looks like the little ramp actually goes in. So the different ramp floors, it probably continuously gets wider and wider and wider as you go through there. The wall heights actually tend to be fairly similar. Kind of, it's got this really interesting sort of curving shape where there's little windows that sort of uh, perforate you know, at the edges of the wall to let light into the different galleries there. But yeah, quite an interesting design. But let's go ahead and see how we can use math to go through and design something like this and get it a whole lot, uh, or yeah, just really uh, yeah, do it far more easily than the architects had to do it when uh, Frank Lloyd Wright designed this one. Okay, so what I'm going to do is go back over to our plan. It's all going to really start with defining the curve. We really just need to start by defining a curve. And let's kind of think about how you can define a curve. Yeah. At some level, we have to define something that's going to sort of grow and have that shape. So let's kind of think about, given what we have available, what we can do. So at some level, it's going to start in the center and kind of okay, so, so mathematically, as you think about something like that, how can you think about starting to define something like that? Okay, so there's definitely some sort of radius, okay, from the center point, and the radius is going to kind of keep on growing a little bit. Okay. Let's kind of think about this. As I started approaching it, I thought about it in terms of there almost being like a certain length along the spiral, and thinking about the number of loops that we were going to create, where coming from here to here would be half a loop, then it'd be a full loop, then one and a half loops, then two loops. Something like that, okay? And if you were thinking about that, okay, at any one point, like how could you define really what the XY location is? So as you go and you start rotating around from here, okay, I'm just gonna think about this, yeah. At the zeroth point, and actually I should really come up like that instead. But at the zeroth point, uh, 
versus over here. Well, let's think about this in terms of length. If we thought about it in terms of degrees, this is zero degrees, this is 90 degrees, that's 200, or 180 degrees, 270, and then we're at the 360. So how can we sort of start relating what the X and Y would be relative to like uh, where you might be like uh, in terms of how far you are with your rotation? Okay, and the kind of hint in all of this is that basically you know, at some level everything comes down to sines and cosines or something like that. So, if we were looking at the 90 degree point, okay, what's the uh, sine at 90? Okay. Cosine is zero. Okay. When we're over here at 180, what's the sine down there? <coughs> zero. And the cosine is minus one. Okay. If we're down here at 270, the sine is minus 1, the cosine is 0. Okay, so the sines and cosines is going to be fairly useful for doing it. It's going to start to sort of think about it. But here, here's what we got to think about, though. It can't just be the sines and cosines, because it's not sort of strictly just 1 or 0. If we did sines or cosines, that would draw a perfect circle. Okay, so. Is there something that we can go through and multiply the sines and cosines by so that at zero it's going to be right in here? And as we go further and further along the length, okay, we get further and further out. And that's what we're going to try and do is really say that starting at zero, to be here. So in terms of thinking about what the x and y should be, okay, it starts with really the sine of the cosine, but we really want to multiply it by some sort of factor in front of it. Kind of like a radius factor. That'll determine like how far out you should be. There's not an equivalent. It's kind of interesting. So, no, we sort of design a single formula that would handle all cases. But, you know, you're absolutely right. That's the way you'd approach it in a lot of languages. You'd sort of say a for loop, and you'd sort of do 10 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees, and just multiply it out there. Here we're going to define a single formula and sort of say, what's the front of the list and what's the back of the list? And it essentially does a for loop for you. But there's nothing that looks like a for loop. It's kind of a real interesting thing. It's a very good kind of question because it's one of the really weird things about doing this kind of list-based programming. So think about this. What if we had a whole series of different points, where the points were at, let's say, 30-degree rotation, 60-degree rotation, 90-degree rotation, 120-degree rotation, 150, 180. So then what we do is go through and sort of figure out what the sines and cosines would be for each of those different points, okay, and multiply them by some funny factor. Okay, now, the factor you should actually multiply this through is really, you know, you, you sort of think of it as sort of being magical, but it's not really. What it wants to be is just somewhere between, you have the inner radius, that you want it to be over here, and you have the outer radius that you want it to be over here. And we're just going to scale between those two different numbers, between inner and outer. Okay, And based on that, as we're going through, we'll just kind of always multiply it by that radius factor, but it starts to give you this funny spirally thing. Okay, so let's just kind of start with that. It really starts with computing x and y values. And the x and y values are generally, we're going to start with just a number of loops that we want it to have. Okay, and then we're going to say how many points we want to put along that. Okay, so I'm going to say number of loops times 360 is how many twists it's going to go around. Then we're just going to go through and compute for all those different points, the sine and the cosine. <coughs> That's pretty good. For the scaling factor, what we're going to do is just sort of take the initial radius 
how tight it wants to get the bottom and the top, and just divide that up into the same number of points as we did over here, and just multiply it by the scaling factor, and that will start to push it out. Okay. Finally, if we wanted to raise, we're going to go through and compute some z values, again, from the initial to the final, okay, along those number of points, and just make the z values raise from the lowest to the highest. Okay, but let's go ahead and start it with just sort of the simple stuff. Let's go through the number of loops and all that. Okay, so if you can, please go over to Revit. Let's see where I hid Revit. I'll go ahead and close my little worm example. I'm going to open, and let's go ahead and take a look at 5.2. And go ahead and open up the expanding spiral. That's a starting point. Let's let it do its thing. Okay, now that's not very interesting looking because it's a floor plan view. That's a little more interesting, but what I'm gonna do is I'm also gonna just, just to make it a little cleaner choose one of those little adaptive components. I already have some things put in here. Just going to say, oh, select all instance of that. Just delete them. All right. okay. We'll get the curve out in just a second. Okay, what I'm going to do now is open up the Dynamo and we'll open up the script. And let's start with 1A. So under 5.2, go to 1A. And we'll go over to the left-hand side and start taking a look at this. Now, it turns out there actually is a helix function built in. Okay? And if you run the helix function, you go ahead and give it a, a starting point, an axis point, a direction. You can go ahead and create this sort of a constant radius spiral. It will go through and kind of create just a helix for you. So if you go ahead and even so far, we haven't done very much. I think we just run this now. I'm just going to think about what it wants for the axis point. I'm not sure if it's going to default to zero or not. It's going to default to zero, 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 zero. OK, great. If you just run this right now, when we just leave the helix by axis function in there, actually did it. Actually, it's already there in the background for me. Do you see it hanging around in there? It's that little, city, little uh, spiral down there. here, bring that up a little. So that's a helix. The difference between that helix and what we want is that helix has a constant radius. You can sort of play with that helix if you want a little bit. There's this uh, notion here of really how many turns it goes. It's going 720 degrees right now. So if you make it 360 or something like that, you get a little less helix. It's only going around once. But they have that helix function. We're just not going to use it because it's not doing what we want. What we want to do is kind of do something very similar. We're going to think about a number of degrees that we're going around. And based on the number of degrees, we're going to figure out for each of the different placement points along the way, really what the sine and cosine would be, because that would sort of start to give us the x and y values. But then we'll have to scale them up a little bit based on you know, how far along the curve we are. So, Starting right in here, I just set up this thing where we're going to do computing x and y values. I just have this sort of number of loops times 360, so 360 degrees for every loop. If I choose two loops, that'll be 720. If I choose three loops or two and a half or whatever I want in there, that should give us slightly different numbers. So that should just be a number so far. Okay, based upon that number, we're going to go through and just divide. You'll see we get all the way up to here, oh, 10,080 okay, degrees. We're going to divide it just into a number of discrete increments. So depending upon how many placement points we have, we're just going to divide from zero to the total number of degrees by the number of points. Okay. So if you choose to divide it into 10 points, you'll get a bunch of different very uh, values. 0, 120, 240, 360, all the way up to 1080. So all we've done so 
done so far is just sort of saying we're going around the uh, we're going around three times and going through and just computing a bunch of different degree values. And for each of those different degree values, that's all of these different locations here, 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 we're moving all the way around. We're going to compute what the sine and the cosine would be. So that's the starting point, but then we'll factor that up. So the sines and cosines, if I have 10 of them over here, should have 10 here, ranging everywhere from 1 to minus 1. Same thing with the sines. So all I've done so far is just gone to go through and computed a bunch of points. So x and y points. And if you wanted to, you could go through and just plot those x and y points. Yeah. If you wanted to see what those points look like, we could just say uh, point by coordinates. Either the XYZ or the XYY version, whichever you like. Grab them here, and if I went through and just pulled in the cosines and the sines, you get a bunch of points. Try. Still trying to do it. Of course, they're very tight right now because they're sort of all tightly wound around that uh, origin. So that's not what we're going to do. We're going to sort of throw in this uh, scaling factor to kind of pull them out from the origin. So to do that, let me remove that guy. What I'm going to do is just say that hey. I've got a scaling factor that I also want to use. It's going to go from the inner radius to the final outer radius, or just initial to final. And these could be any numbers you want. But basically, we're going to say, OK, for 0 degrees, make it 8.5. For 10,080 degrees, make it 40.5, and just scale along the way. Okay. So what I'm doing is taking inner and our initial and final radius, okay, and I'm just putting in a number of points between. And the number of points I want to put in is actually the same number of points that I'm dividing the curve up into, because I really want a one-to-one -one correspondence. I want a scaling factor for every point. Okay. So if you go hanging around down in here and you take a look at this, okay, 8.5 at the center, 12.05, going all the way up to 40.5. Super. So if you take those two different things, those scaling factors and these sines and cosines, and get them all together, what happens is now you have a bunch of x, y's that are sort of scaled out. And again, let me try this. I'll put point by coordinates in here, just so you can sort of see if those are the x's and those are the y's. And I go back out to my geometry. Let's see if I can orbit that around a little bit. It's a little hard to tell the scaling right now. What's going, you know, or is it going here to here to here to here? It's, it's spiraling out. It's a little hard to see right now. But if we'd like to see that, we should put a curve in there, because that would make it a whole lot easier. Okay. So once I have those x and y's and I have my points by coordinates, what I can do, actually right there is where I did the coordinates right there. Get rid of that one. If you'd like to make a nice curve out of those coordinates, we have all sorts of uh, different functions available. The one I'm going to recommend is this thing called NURBS curve. NURBS curve makes a non-uniform rational beast line. It's just kind of a really nice, well-fit curve. If you take those points and you drag them over to this curve, you'll get something like that where you can start to see the spiral. Let's talk about the fineness of that curve. 
because we've been using some placement points to put that curve in there. You might say that doesn't look very spirally. That kind of looks like it's got elbows and it's a little non-smooth and all that kind of stuff. And that just really has to do with how many placement points we're using okay, versus the total length of the curve. So if you're looking at something like this and it's not very spirally or it's not very smooth, we can either increase the number of definition points or decrease the total length, either one. But somehow the length versus the uh, kind of number of definition points looks a little non-smooth right now. If I wanted to change that, let's go back over here. There's my number of loops. This is my number of points. Let me change it to 20 points, for example, see if that looks better. Okay, that's looking a whole lot better. It's really just a matter of like, if you're trying to do best fit of curve and how many points you give it, you know, how much information you're giving it. Okay, let me go ahead and even uh, reduce the number of loops. Okay, let's see how you guys are doing. Yeah, in terms of having a basic spiral. Do you have a spiral? Excellent, spiral, spiral? Good spirals, excellent, okay, beautiful. Your spiral is looking great here, except for one problem. It's kind of lying there flat on the ground. Okay, and if we'd like to change that, not to worry. We just have to give it some Z values. Our Z values are all currently set to zero, so we'd like to give them, again, just sort of a range of values. We're gonna need a Z value for every point. Okay, so, Go ahead and pop out there. We're just gonna go through and compute some z values. For my z values, again, kind of like the scaling factor for the radius, we'll have an initial height and a final height. Okay, so we'll have some different sliders there. You can make them whatever you want. We'll say initial height, final height, and we'll have a series of points that are using the same number of points. Again, we want that one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay, so if you go through and say from zero to 30, okay, you get that list of points. If you say that you wanna go 20 to 50, you get a slightly different list of points. Okay, but these are all just Z values. So what we wanna do is take those Z values and just grab the Z values and put them in right here as the Z coordinates. Now, you have a good looking spiral. Not too off the bat. Now the cool news is, you know, this spiral is ever so flexible because, let's go ahead and kind of pop the, uh, Geometry back in here again, or the definitions. Oh, slide that over here. If you were to ha prefer to have something that kind of follows the radius going from, yes, come on. Oh, screen up. There you go. this over here just so we can see. Actually, I need to shrink that up so we can see that better. Okay, so if we just choose to change that radius, and here's the beauty of the parametric design. If we choose to change the radius so the inner radius is bigger, or the upper radius is smaller, We could have things that taper in, we could have things that taper out. We can go ahead and kind of push the base back down to zero. We can kind of make it very tall and skinny or make it flatter. But because you're basically doing this with math, and math is very quick to compute, you have these placement points that are really gonna be useful for determining everything else we need to do. So 
it's kind of very quick. You know, when they were doing the design for the Guggenheim, they wanted this. They went through and did all these calculations, probably with slide rules and a lot of manual calculations. But as soon as we have that curve, we can start playing around with that curve, either placing walls on that curve to kind of make vertical surfaces, or we could go ahead and make another curve inside of that one to make the floor surface. But we can start creating that ramp with the constant curvature all the way up, which is really kind of handy to be able to do something like that and be able to kind of keep on flexing the floor as we need to. Okay, let's do this. Let's go ahead and take a break now. If you can, come back in five. And when you do come back, we'll go ahead and make some surfaces on this and then check, start looking at how we start dividing other sorts of surfaces. Yes, Tony? Oh, I have another basic question. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Hang tight. Let me stop the recording and we will take on your question. <laughs>